Well, that's how I feel some days too. Come and bring it on. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be here. This is, um, it's absolutely amazing. And um, my wife, Nedra, some of you don't know Nedra, but some of you do. Uh, she will be extremely envious of me getting to be here with you. So I have never, ever done this in all the years of ministry. So just smile because she's going to say, who all was there? And now I can show her and one for good measure. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I feel so much better now. I, uh, I had been looking forward to this for so long. It's been a long time since I've been in a pulpit. I do a lot of presenting with the work I do now, but to be with the body believers and to be with the men that we had this weekend, it, it just was a thrill for me. And, and I'm excited about today because normally I don't get the opportunity to preach for three hours, so I'm just <laughs> looking forward to this. Got a lot of material. Roger, thank you for your songs, man. And Nick, uh, thank you for your thoughts, too. It was one of those days that you fall into bed and you say, wow, that was tough. Forerunner of Jesus, John, had a run-in with Herod and ended up losing his head over it. Jesus wanted to take his disciples and get them away from everything, the chaos that was going on. And then he had planned to go up on the mountain by himself and just spend time with the Father, which I think is very, very interesting. That if Jesus feels like it's important to get away with the Father, how much more should we? And then Jesus' plan of getting away with his disciples and just kind of taking a breath is thwarted because people, wherever they heard Jesus was, went to him. They want to be healed. They want to just see him. And do you know, in Jesus' His ministry, he never once said, why are you intruding on my private space? Why are you interrupting? He embraced them, blessed them, feeds them, 5,000 of them, one of the great miracles we talk about. And then he saw things shift a little bit. John's record of it reads like this, and after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Jesus knew that there was a storm brewing, and it was with people wanting to force him into their image of what he needed to do. He didn't want his disciples to be part of that, so he sent them away. And ironically, they end up in a different kind of storm. It's not a political movement per se. It is more a storm on a lake. I want to show you a couple pictures. Uh, this is the Sea of Galilee. And it looks like it'd be a pretty nice place to go vacation at. And it is known for its fresh water, for its fish, for its moderate temperatures. The problem is it's also known for its storms. Because where it's located, the winds can come sweeping out of the mountains and create some turbulent water. Sometimes the swells can be seven feet high, and man, I don't want to be in the middle of that with a little boat that they had. And I love Rembrandt's rendition of this. I think that's good. Because you see the sheer panic on people's faces. You know that panic because it's been in your life as well, and mine too. As I was trying to think what to share this weekend, and as I shared with the men uh, Friday night and then all day Saturday, yesterday, we talked about what it's like to be in the storm and how do you trust when you're in the storm. It is easy to sing your hallelujahs and praise God when everything goes great. It really is, isn't it? We can smile, put on our smiley face. But man, when the waves come crashing and all of a sudden your world is starting to sink, it's harder to say, God, you're good. In fact, what we normally say is, God, where are you? What's going on? I'll get there in a second. 
So in the text that was just read to us, the disciples were in the storm. And, and I want you to think about this. And maybe if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this. The disciples were in the storm because they were obeying Jesus. Please let that sink in. They weren't being punished. I cannot tell you how many times I would go to the hospital and visit somebody and they would say something this effect. Why is God punishing me? What sin have I done that now he is getting me for? And it would break my heart because they're already in sorrow with the event itself. And then they're asking God, what did I do wrong? And it's just not the picture many, 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 many times. Does God punish sin? Absolutely. But not in a lot of the situations that we always say he does. And so we ask God, where are you? Why is this happening? I think the disciples probably had some of the very same things. Here's the problem, though. They were in the middle of the storm because they listened to Jesus, not disobeyed Jesus. And that's a huge point I want you to take away. And here's just something else that's really interesting to me. Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray, and all of a sudden the storm starts developing. Not unusual for that area, for that lake. But the storm never surprised Jesus. Think about that. He didn't stop his prayers and go, wait a minute, wait, wait, what's going on? Oh, my word, I should have had him go by land, not by sea. Now look what's happening. I didn't see that coming on. That's our response. That's never Jesus' response. Does that make sense? Never Jesus' response. There's never something he goes, wow, I should have thought of that. Huh, Shazam. Wow, it's never happened before. John 16, verse 33. I, I love what he says. Um, well, I'm going to back up here a second. Can I back up on this, Jeff? I have to ask permission. That's great. John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Please hear that. In him we find our peace. Thank you for the songs you shared, man. Right on track. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. It's in the presence of the Lord that we find our peace. It's not in the presence of people. Sometimes they help us, but it's the Lord that gives us ultimately that peace. And so Jesus follows, calls his followers to follow him, journey with him, and he even knows that the storms will come. I love it that he is so realistic about life. Life is not always hunky-dory. Hallmark movies are not always your life. I love Hallmark movies. You pull my man card, but I love Hallmark movies. <laughs> my wife and I'll sit there watching them, and every once in a while the dust gets in my eye. I just don't know what goes on. But sometimes our lives don't go that way. I shared with the guys yesterday, since we left this church, and some of you that I don't know and you don't know me, we were here for six years, so blessed to be part of this congregation. Uh, here with the process of coming into this building, I still love this. One of the few auditoriums and everything. Oh, that's it, because you can preach like this. We need it back here, too, but you can preach like this. <laughs> we went to Memphis, Tennessee for eight and a half years. Then we, um, we went up to Overland Park, Kansas for eight and a half years. And uh, that didn't turn out the way I thought it would turn out. And I'm not dissing anybody there, but the last church I preached at, I got fired. Didn't see that coming, did you? Nor did I. We affectionately, my wife and I, say 2015 was our year from hell. I had a hip replaced. She had a foot rebuilt. My father had dementia. We put him in a rest home. He died a month later. Her mom died probably about five months after that. In a three-month period, she had three of her uncles die, all within this year, plus more. It was a storm. But I don't say that for you to feel sorry for me. I'm just telling you that's how life runs. And even as I was thinking about who I would see today, I know some of your storms. I know your storm. Dean, I know your storm. And I know storms from years past that you might have even forgotten, but I haven't forgotten them. And so when we're looking at this text, I want to make it so practical for us. And here's a question I want to ask. What if life is something to be conquered, 
but an adventure to be experienced with Jesus where we learn, grow, and are shaped by the good times and the storms. What if? What if that's the whole thing right there? There's a guy by the name of Bob Goff. Some of you may or may not have heard of him. Uh, if you have not read any of his material, he's got one that's called Love Does. The guy is absolutely crazy. <clears throat> he is so amazing. He'll come up here. If, if I were Bob Goff, he'll, hey, everybody, God, how are you? It's so good to see you. That's almost a direct quote. I mean, that's the best impersonation I could do. He is so full of life, it just blows me away. I've got to hear him several times. And he is just an amazing man, extremely successful lawyer. That's going to play into the story I tell you in just a second. But he sure loves Jesus. And he lives on the edge of things. He might throw a huge party for their whole community just because it's a beautiful day. So he has something, a 10-year-old adventure that he told his wife he wanted to do. And so when the kids turn 10... They could pick any spot in the world. I told you he was a very successful lawyer. And they would go there just because. And so Lindsay was the first one that turned 10 in their family. And so she loved to do tea parties. And so she said, Dad, where, where do you think they drink a lot of tea? And he goes, I don't know, maybe London. Go figure. A week later, they are on a flight to London. And he said, the goal with this was just to spend time with them, to have an adventure, to build memories with them. And so they did. He said, we didn't even take consideration jet lag. We landed, we took off, we went to the palace, we went to the Thames, we went everywhere we could. We went barefoot through Hyde Park. And men, we had such a great experience. And then last, before we came home, we went to the Ritz and had tea, high tea. He never plans those trips. He just experiences those trips. And that just made some of you break into a sweat. Some of you, that is your worst nightmare. My daughter is kind of like Bob Goff. <clears throat> she is filled with so... Some of you said I've seen her on the Facebook post. She, she's incredible. My son's incredible too, but he's a little more reserved. But she's like way out there. And uh, so she and her husband have done this two or three times. Well, they'll plan. No, they won't. They will say, we're going on a family vacation. And literally, they have done this. They wake up in the morning and roll the dice. And whatever number comes up, they go north, south, east, or west. And I'm going, I can't do that. I've got to know where I'm going, where are we staying, where are we going to eat, and all that stuff. But they love it because it's an adventure. And so Bob Goff says this that I think was, oh, by the way, I think that's why some of us have a hard time trusting God. We don't want to let go of control. Can I say that? I guess I can because I just did. We don't like to let God be in control. We want him to be our passenger on our journey. And oftentimes, I told the men this, I think oftentimes we have God and this whole idea of trust in him completely and he will make your path straight as long as I get to say on where the path is going. You with me? And God says, that's not how this works. If you want it to work the way I want it, you do what Jesus did and you say, come. And so here's what Bob Goff says that I thought was just hilarious, but in a very, really good way. Every day, God invites us on the same kind of adventure. It's not a trip where he sends us a rigid itinerary. He simply invites us. And then learning together, he leans over and he whispers, let's do this together. I I want you to do me a favor for just a second, if you would. I want you to close your eyes. I won't do anything weird to you, I promise. And I want to read this over you because I think it is such a beautiful prose about journeying with God. Here we go. Just close your eyes and let this wash over you. I used to think God was my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I died. He was out there sort of like a president. And I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. Later on, when I met Jesus, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that Jesus was in the back helping me pedal. And I didn't know just where it was he suggested 
I don't know, but he suggested we change. And life has not been the sense since I took the back seat and he started driving. He makes life exciting. When I had control, I thought I knew the way. It was rather boring but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points, but when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts up the mountains through the rocky places at neck-breaking speeds, and it was all I could do to hang on. And even though I often looked, it looked like madness, he'd say, pedal. I was worried and anxious and asked, where are, we taking, where are you taking me? Where are we going? He would laugh and didn't answer. And I started to learn to trust, and I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure. And when I said, I'm scared, he leaned back and touched my hand. I did not trust him at first in control of my life. I I thought he'd wreck, but he knows bike secrets, and he knows how to take bends and sharp corners and jump rocks and do great things. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus. And when I'm sure I just can't do it anymore, he smiles and he says, pedal, pedal. I think that's a beautiful expression of what it means to journey with God. And, and, and I don't know what came to your mind as you listened to that. I got to tell you, Roger, when you started um, singing in his presence, I started welling up with tears. And I'll tell you why. Angels all around. And I mentally pictured angels here today in this place covering you guys. And it really did make me tear up. I wish God would sometimes just open our eyes to see the things that are really going on beyond our minutia of the day that we're worried about. I wish that he would show us like Elisha's servant where he would say, just look. And the mountains were filled with chariots of fire and God's holy angels. And we're not alone. And the reason I wish we would see that is because some of you are in the storms right now. And you need to hear him say, I'm with you. It's okay. Jesus could have calmed the storm before he did. I want you to think about that. He's up on the hillside on the mountains and he looked out there and he saw what was going on. And he could have at that moment said, stop it. You're scaring my boy. Stop it. There was not... A distance factor for him. i got to get in range before my power works. Oop, too close. Almost, yes. He could have just said, be quiet. But he didn't. And I wonder if he did that on, whoa, he always does stuff on purpose, doesn't he? And I wonder if he led it to where his disciples exhausted all of their resources, all of their thinking, here's how we can control this. And finally, when they could just scream, Jesus, where are you? He says, here we go. That's what I was waiting for. We love to fix all of our problems, don't we? We think we know best. And Jesus said, oh, I wish you did, but you don't, and I do. I love the statement what Goff says in his book there. He said, when Jesus invites us to an adventure, he shapes who we become with what happens along the way. There it is. A lot of times when we are in the middle of our storms, we might ask, why God? Where are you? And I think God wants us to ask a different question. I think he wants to ask this question. What do I need to learn? in this storm? What is it you're trying to teach me in this storm? Because sometimes in our arrogance, forgive me, I'm going to be blunt with you, but in our arrogance of thinking we're in control and we know what's best, he doesn't have enough room to kind of squeeze into our agendas. Is that fair? It's okay if you say amen here too. Is that fair? Okay, thank you. So, When Jesus finally finds the moment where they're ready to give up and they they are trying to find his sovereignty in all this, he comes. So let's talk a little bit about the the invitation. In the middle of the battling the storm, Jesus goes out to them. And I, I, I was going over my notes again. I thought, 
That is so powerful. That's what he always does. He comes and goes to them. I said a little bit of the class over here on the Pentateuch, and we were talking about temple. Where's the teacher for that? All right, okay, thank you, man. Because I thought we were talking about why the temple? Because God says, I want to come here and dwell. I, I want to be among my people. He is not the God who's out there. Oh, he is out there, but he's also the God who's right here. And oftentimes, I would, I would like to ask you to think about this. Where's your God live? Oh, he's there. Well, he is, but he's also here. And now we are the temple. And I love the fact when you were talking about the temple, it's, it's a place where God comes to be with his people. So Peter, man, I love Peter, man after my own heart. He spouts off things before he even thinks them through, and I do that so often, get in trouble, but man, it's fun. And Peter goes, man, if it's you, Lord, command me to come. That's literally what the Greek says, command me to come. I think Peter needed Jesus to say, Peter, come out of that boat now. He needed that, that boldness to draw him into the water. But Peter wanted to be in the middle of the storm, in the water with Jesus, because he felt safer there than in the boat. Think about that. That's mind-boggling, right? And Roger, as you started talking about that, you alluded to a little bit this, that Peter walks in the water. Uh, but, but the point is, Jesus invited him into the middle of the storm on the water. The way God invites people to journey with him. Come, follow me. Okay? Where are we going? Come, follow me. What's the agenda look like? Come on. Trust me. Where are we going? Come, follow me. What are we going to do on this trip, Jesus? Come, follow me. It, it's hard to live with, oh, whoa, 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 faith. That's what this journey is all about, isn't it? A faith journey. That's what he did with Abram. Abram, leave the land of your fathers. Come on, let's go. Where are we going? They're going to have malls there? What's it going to be like? It's going to be a good trip. Just come, follow me. It's what Jesus did with his disciples. Drop your nest. Come on, let's go. Follow me. But you didn't explain everything. No, I didn't. All I said is come follow me. And his invitation is always backed with this promise. I'm here. I'm here. So I'm going to real quickly share some lessons I think that we can learn out of this. Uh, I, I want to think about Peter. Peter was changed forever. From not just walking on water, but probably from sinking and Jesus saving him. He never was the same person again. And so I, 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 wonder, I, I think this is interesting. I doubt Peter would want to go through the terrifying experience like that again, almost drowning. But I'm guessing he was glad he had gone through it as it changed his life, how he saw Jesus, how his faith was deepened, and how he could face the future storms because he had learned the most important lesson that he could have learned. Where do you stare in the storm? Where do you stare in the storm? I stole that from some, I mean, I borrowed that from somebody, but man, it's good. Where do you stare in the storm? Because his focus got on the waves, his focus got on his ineptitude that he couldn't, I've never done this before. I don't think I've ever walked on water before. And all of his focus started going there. And Jesus just kept saying, look at me. Look at me. It's kind of like when you parent. I know you never did, but we always just say, hey, look at my eye. Come here. You look at my eyes. Right? We want to get the focus where it's supposed to be so we can teach them something. And Jesus doesn't say it like that. He says, hey, look here. You're okay. You're okay. I know this is scary. Never done this before. By the way, he didn't give him a primer how to do that. Just take your right leg, step out. Yeah, that's a good boy. Okay, now take your right leg and then lean into the wind. I've got you. He doesn't do any of that. He just says, come on. And he let Peter learned a lesson that transformed who he was. That's why at the end of the section, there's a very interesting thing, I think. This is verse 32. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly are, you are the Son of God. Before, they were amazed by Jesus. Now they're in awe of Jesus. Before they were in wonder, wonder of Jesus, now they 
worship Jesus. Now, I, I, I hope I put this in the notes. Let me look real quick. There you go. Listen to this real carefully. If you take nothing away, please hear this. I'm going to read it up off the screen. Whatever you do after you have witnessed the majesty of God is worship. Whatever happens. And so you've got Isaiah in Isaiah 6, where he cries out to God when he sees the glory of the majesty. He says, woe in me, you know, and that is worship. And the disciples, like Peter, when they had this huge catch of fish, he says, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. What is that? That's worship. And sometimes you declare God's sovereignty as the disciples did. That's worship. Sometimes you fall fall down on your face in humility and saying, I just don't understand how you can love me. I know who I am. What is that? It's a worship. What you do when you truly understand the majesty of God is worship. Does that make sense? I wish somebody would have told me that when I was young. We're going to go to worship today. Yes and no. Do you realize you could sing beautiful songs without worshiping? Do you realize you can listen to a sermon without worshiping? Because it doesn't connect you with the presence and the holiness of God. So let me make it real practical, real quick. What do we do in the storms? I think we need to, first of all, eh, see if I'm there, you can only do it as you live in a deep sense. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. You've got to learn how to live with the presence of God. Again, nobody taught me that. Be real honest with you real quick. I've got an hour and a half to go, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> The little congregation I grew up in, I told the guys this. Central Illinois, small church building that would have fit about here. 90% of everybody that came to that church were my aunts, uncles, and cousins. Okay? Some of you know that. They did the best they knew how. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you straight up. When I was a junior in high school, I told my mom I'm dying spiritually, and I didn't even know what that meant. All I knew is I learned a lot of rules, but nobody really taught me how to be in the presence of God. Am I making this clear enough? I could tell you a lot of facts from the Bible. I just couldn't tell you what it was like walking with Jesus day by day and living with that deep sense of presence. He's out there because he's sovereign Lord, but he's right here. And once you start understanding what it means to live in the presence of the Lord, you don't ever want to go back again. You don't want to just be religious. I don't ever want to be religious again. I want to be spiritual. And I want to live with that deep sense that he is here. Um, I don't know if any of you, this is older stuff now, but it just it spoke to so many of us. Sarah Young wrote a book, Jesus Calling. Did any of you read that little tiny book? And it was all about what it's like if Jesus were speaking directly to you. And I'm going to read just one excerpt to give you an illustration. I I want you to watch in hope as you wait for me, your Savior. Wait expectantly, confident that I'll do what's best. The longer you have to wait, the more you must rely on your trust in me. So this is like she writes from it's Jesus talking straight to you. If you start feeling anxious, seek my help. With short prayers like, Jesus, fill me with your peace. You may breathe these brief prayers as often as you need. And you put your hope in me. My unfailing love rests upon you. Or maybe we ought to memorize Psalm 33, verse 20 and 22. We wait in hope for the Lord. Say that with me, please. We wait in hope for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. Say it. He's our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love rest upon us. O Lord, as we put our hope in You. Man, what if that's a prayer that we just memorized and we shouted out? I love what John Ortberg said when he was writing about this episode in Jesus' ministry. He said, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. It's a no-brainer. If you want to experience the power of God in your life, you've got to take a step of faith and involves risky obedience. You don't know me well enough, some of you, but I'm going to say this. Some of you are living too cautious with your lives. 
and your faith is not expanding, you're not deepening that relationship because you're not wanting to get out of the boat. Is that fair? And when you start to sink, I think you just need to cry out for his strength. Lord, save me. Wow. That wasn't a sermon that Peter had prepared. It was a response. Lord, save me. And that simple prayer is one of the best prayers you can ever pray. Middle of your storm, Lord, save me. And Jesus says, come on. And it's no wonder following Christ is an adventure, but it's really a focus issue. And guess what? I, I think this is really important as well. Our I'm terrified is always matched with Jesus' I'm here. I'm terrified, Lord. I'm here. So embrace the lessons of the storm is something else I want you to share with you. Uh, storms do something to us. They, they sort through what's real about our faith and what is pretend. Uh, they make us face ourselves, see our own weaknesses, and force us to depend upon God's presence. Here's the interesting thing, too. Our storms equip us now to sympathize with other storm people. I'll tell you a quick story. I just wrote up my notes before I got up here. Uh, I was in a church preaching, and there was uh, one of the elders' wives. Uh, she admitted to me one time, she said, I, I just didn't have a lot of sympathy for people. You know, people would say they're depressed or they're, you know, not, they're not doing well. And I think, oh, come on, buck up. That, my word's not hers. She'd say, you know, and I just think, come on, get over it. She and her husband were driving on an expressway one day, and they stopped along the side of the road to switch drivers. She got into drive, and as she was looking on the road to get into the lane, she did not see the hitchhiker right there that she ran over. I'm at her house after that event. She now knew what it meant to be depressed. And she said, in essence, I was so arrogant the way I treated other people. Now, I hate that she had to go through that, but do you see my point? When you get into the storms, after a while, you learn how to try to comfort other storm survivors. So, and then I think lastly, we've got to learn how to worship the storm calmer. Isn't that fair? But he says, hey, peace be still. And they worshiped him. I love uh, Psalm 119.71. It's good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn from your decrees. Or as the message says, my troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Okay, I want to close with something that is going to be a little hard, but I want to show you this is how I want to go out. This is Josh Patrick. I knew Josh down in Memphis, Tennessee when we were down there. This young man was an incredible disciple of Jesus. He was in a church that was across town, and um, he loved Jesus so much, he loved people so much, that in a congregation, probably, I, I'm going to say there were probably six, 700 people, he had probably a class of young couples that were probably 100 couples. Please hear that. Because his discipleship, his passion for Jesus, they just came flocking to Josh. I mean, just incredible. The person on the right is his wife, Joni, and their kids. So I'm going to read just a little bit with you, and I'm done. You ready? Josh went into the emergency room, was eventually admitted to the hospital on Thursday, January 22nd, due to severe abdominal pain. A scan revealed a mass in his colon, which was successfully removed during surgery on Monday. The pathology report confirms the diagnosis of colon cancer, which is spread to the liver. This situation is sobering, but we are hopeful. Church, I'm asking you to pray for them, but I want you to hear what their focus was. So they put out this statement, and, and I, I just want you to hear this. This is a storm walker. Number one, we trust God. This is what they wrote. This is the biggest trial, and it's bigger than us. We simply can't handle it on our own. God has proven His faithfulness over and over again, and we believe that nothing is too hard for Him, and we will surrender this entire situation to Him one day at a time. I'm telling you what they wrote. We choose joy. 
We're asking God to fill us with joy. In, in His presence, there's a fullness of joy, and we find reason to be joyful one day at a time. Number three, we embrace hope. Hope is more than the shallow optimism. It's a confident expectation that good things are coming in the future. And we've decided as a family to embrace this hope and expect God to perform miracles of healing and restoration one day at a time. You with me so far? I'm almost done. Number four, we practice gratitude. In the middle of the storm, gratitude has become our weapon of choice against discouragement, fear, and self-pity. Oh, somebody needs to hear this today. Instead of focusing on what is not going our way, we will do our best to watch for God's fingerprints and give thanks in all circumstances one day at a time. Are you guys with this story right here? On January the 13th, 2019, Joni's words, Josh was completely healed. And his prayer answered as he went to be home with his Savior, the one he and Joni trusted completely. We don't like the ending of that story. We would rather say, and Josh was miraculous healed, and all the doctors said, we don't know how that happened. We've never seen that before, but he was healed, just not in the way that we would normally think. Now, why would I end a lesson like that? That's so depressing. I'm not telling you that for that. That's how I want to live my life. Recently, I saw the movie Twisters. Uh, it's about storm chasers, which I don't know whether I ought to applaud their courage or think they're stupid. I don't know. I've got figured that out. But we're not storm chasers. We are storm survivors. And we cry out, Lord, help me. And Jesus says, I'm here. I want you to close your eyes, please, and I want to pray over you. And I'm going to ask while I'm praying if I could have the shepherds come down front, please. Father, sometimes life is filled with such great adventures. We laugh together. We celebrate your goodness and your grace. We applaud your power. But sometimes, Father, we find ourselves right in the middle of the storms. The bottom falls out of everything. Our dreams, our hopes have been shattered. And Father, we're asking questions like, what in the world just happened? Where are you, God? Why are you doing this? But God, help us to ask the right questions. Help us just to cry out, Lord, save us. Father, I love this group of people. Some of the people I don't even know, but I love them because this is a body of your church a body of believers that are desperately trying to not only make it through life this way with you, but they are here to help other people hear the message of hope. And God, if there's somebody here today that's in the middle of a storm, I pray that you respond with, I love you, I'm here. And that they hear it in a way that will calm their fears. God, we know we don't make it through this world alive. Nobody does. So, Father, we realize sometimes the healing is like Josh's healing. It's in your presence where, Father, we will never, ever, ever regret being there. Lift our hearts. Fill us with a deep sense of who you are. Strip us of our arrogance. Strip us of the stupid things we get focused on that don't have meaning. And fill us with your presence, your power, your promises and help us to be seekers of other people to share the good news of Jesus. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, and together we say, Amen. Listen, as the elders are down here in front, if you've got a storm you're chasing and you want them to pray over you, just come on down here. I know normally they go in the back. I ask them to come to front because I want it to be a visible thing. Um, Roger, will you lead us in that song, please? And man, don't hesitate. If you want prayers... These are godly men. This is a place of safety. Right, guys? So let's stand up together and let's sing together. Hey, by the way, one last thing. Sorry, Jeff. Some of you have never surrendered to Jesus, never been baptized in the Lord. Man, I would love for you to do that today. Wouldn't that be a great way to end our service? Somebody said, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. 
So we would love that as well. But man, just let God touch your heart. Let's stand together and sing.